So hi everybody, I am, uh, my name's John. I'm the creative director of the Oatly Department of Mind Control. Um, so, if you don't know what we do, we make uh, something called oat milk. And we've been making oat milk way before it was cool to make oat milk. In fact, we've been making oat milk in the 1990s, when the only people that actually knew what oat milk were were those who were lactose intolerant and those who were vegan. And um, this happened until my friend Tony Peterson became CEO in 2012. And we found a way to explain exactly what oat milk was, because most people don't understand it. It's like, so you have a cow, and you don't just take the oats and make a milk, instead of taking the oats and running it through the pre-processing plant, the cow. And we also found this like, very simple way to explain what we're, we're doing. It's called, like, it's like milk, but made for humans. The researchers who actually came up with oat milk, they're the ones who found lactose intolerance. So it's a very science-based product, and they made a milk based on oats specific, specifically for humans. Now, this was great, but it tended to piss off the Swedish milk lobby. The Swedish milk lobby is somewhat similar to the gun lobby in the US. They're extremely powerful. So the first thing that they did is they decided, OK, we have to stop these guys. We'll sue them. So they, you know, it's a couple months after we did a relaunch, they dropped a 174-page lawsuit on us. And what they sued us for specifically was this illustration, because they thought it was very misleading that the milk comes out of the ass of the cow and not actually, you know, where it comes from. And they sued us for this one, too, of course, because they said, you make milk sound outdated and old-fashioned, which, of course, it is. But if you ask 100 biologists if this is true, they will say, well, milk is basically for baby cows. You can always buy off one. But milk is basically for baby cows. And so our milk is for humans. What they didn't know, the milk lobby, is that we only had one strategic document. And that was this. And it basically said if we're ever going to make oat milk popular, we have to be fucking fearless. And most of the other companies are basically scared shitless. So that makes it somewhat easy. Some of them are good or some of them are bad. So we've got to be fucking fearless and we have to be super transparent and super good. Monsanto is on the bottom. They'll sue anyone. So what we did is as soon as they sued us, we took the whole lawsuit and we put it online so everyone could see it. And then we ran full page ads in all the Swedish morning newspapers that said, look, the milk lobby feels threatened and they're being bullies and they're suing us. And then since Tony's my friend, we convinced him to write his own song and to sing it in the middle of, the oat, uh, in the middle of an oat field. And it goes like this. Yeah, that's the 60-minute version. But. And the thing is, is that because we were having so much fun, we thought, why not just put it everywhere? So we literally put it everywhere. <laughs> so that, of course, everyone could see it. And so what do you think actually happened? We became like this crazy, disruptive challenger brand, like one of the most famous brands in Sweden overnight. Thank you very much, Milk Lobby. And you sent us from being this like very tiny $20 million sales per year company to 200 million, 400 million, um, the story continues, in quite a few short years. This is a food product, remember. It's, a, it's an oat milk. So you can say like, wow, that sounds really simple, was really easy, but actually it wasn't. When Tony became CEO in 2012, he called me up and he said, John, I'm CEO of this oat milk company. This is what it looked like. 
pours from the right. The ugliest, the chocolate one is maybe the ugliest packaging in, in, in world history. And this is what we had to work with. So I said to Tony, okay, Tony, that's really cool. I'm really happy for you. Congratulations. You got this one by yourself because I don't want anything to do with oat milk. And then I thought for a second and said, wait a second. Maybe I can kill the marketing department. So if I kill the marketing department, this will be fun be because my background's advertising. So I always figured marketing directors, they're the ones who are like ruining my work. Maybe the quotes go around work instead because you can always ask whether or not it's work. Tony said, of course, sure, go ahead, I don't care. And it's like, so what could possibly go wrong? You're gonna take creatives, creatives who make ideas and tell stories and you're gonna sit them in the middle of a food company, okay? And when I say in the middle of a food company, we're in the marketing meetings, sales meetings, innovation meetings, product development meetings. We're not, we're not briefed, we're in the middle of the meetings. Supply production, finance. We're not in finance. And so what happens is, you get this way of working that's completely different. First of all, we eliminated the need for a brief. If you think about it, if, you're, if you have a, if you have a marketing department, you're gonna brief your, your agency, come up with an idea, so you brief them. What do you brief them for? So the creative has some context and it is up to speed on what they're doing. And two, you brief them so that the marketing director doesn't get this crazy shit idea that they don't know how to deal with it. So we don't have that problem. We're sitting in all the meetings, it's very collaborative. We pull out what we want and then we execute it which means that what you do is by getting rid of the marketing department, you actually build trust in the company and you get this very super collaborative system. It also allows us to like focus on two things, not approvals, but focus on actually creating ideas and then executing them. Instead of like discussing what the CEO might think. So this is how this is how most companies work. You have the CEO and he's like separated from everyone else, and then you have the commercial and the marketing director and they're like talking, and then they're gonna brief a bunch of agencies. Um, and they're gonna brief, you know, your ad agency or PR agency, and it's this ebb and flow of constant, you know, approvals and briefs and debriefs, and it looks something like this. And so imagine if you take away brand awareness studies, target group analysis, midway meetings, feedback meetings, we basically go straight from, oh, this is an idea, and then we execute it, and then we change the deadlines, or we do something else when we think there's a better idea, and then we approve it. There's no one else who's approving our ideas. And we never get the, you know, oh shit, we have to start over all over again. Here's our system. Constant meetings, talking about certain things, Oh, there's an idea, execute. All the, exec all the energy's on execution. And that means this is basically, this is basically um, the rebrand. It's all hand-drawn. So everything is, ex execution is absolutely everything. And this is all hand-drawn. And it means that we can do a lot of work. Like this was the first, one of the first things that we did because we figured like, no one even knows what Oatly is, so we might as well just do a series of films where you stick the, the product there, and it would just look like this. So the, the other good thing about this is that we figured, because we're creatives, it's like, wow, we can have an opinion. Like we can have a, like a personal opinion, like we're a company, but we can have an opinion. And if you have an opinion, guess what happens? You become human and you become real and you don't become a corporation. This is our packaging sides. They say exactly how it is. Here's the things that we believe in. Um, we're not like a real company. We wanna be a good company. It's like, we're not perfect, but you know, um, our intentions are true. And so we use the packaging to tell our story and to become less corporate and more real. So that makes us like more of a human and less as a logo. And what you do get there is you build up a lot of trust actually 
with your consumers. From there, it's like, so how do you do this? Like, we're a very small department, and we have a lot of different markets. So we figured that if we become this ongoing voice, then what we do is we create this huge dialogue with people, and we don't have to work in campaigns, and we don't have to come up with new strategies. We don't have to answer to KPIs and ROIs and USPs. We don't even use them. I don't know what they're good for. I have no idea. Um, and what that means is wherever we go in the world, think of it like as a, as a person. Like, you don't change if you go someplace else. You become a little bit different. You maybe speak a little differently depending on uh, where you are. But you're basically, um, you're the same person. So that means that we just continue this voice um, wherever we go. And this is what it looks like. Many of you have seen probably um, our voice because we tend to put it in very public areas. We'll stick an ad for oat drink anywhere. This was in Helsinki when we launched our ice cream. And this is like no marketing department would ever let you use all that space just to say the same thing. So, the other good thing about the working this way is that we can basically flip everything. Like, no matter what happens in the market, I don't have to look at what the competitor's doing. If there's an opportunity, we can do it. So, remember the story about the dairy industry. So, Arla, the big milk company in Sweden, they thought, like, last year they were going to take this big, big stab at us and do this series of, 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 of commercials that actually made fun of plant-based milk. And so they gave it a fake name, like in Swedish, the word mjölk, they turned it into like brölk or pjölk. So, um, and their thing was like, only milk tastes like milk. So we're like, that's pretty cool, but you guys should have probably registered those names. It only takes a few minutes to register them. So we register them because we thought those are pretty cool names. And then we stuck them on our packages. It's like you, they, they, call you an, they call you an idiot on the playground, and you're like, I'm an idiot. And then it's like, <laughs> it's done. So the other thing that happens is, is that we're able to take responsibility for every single part of everything that we're doing, like the whole thing. Like if you breathe an agency, they do one part, but then you have the rest of it. We're, I, we're looking at the shelf wobbler, the Instagram post, everything we do. It's like everything works in unison. So everything plays together, and because we have this department that's looking after it, we can pay attention to absolutely everything. The other thing is that we do a lot of stuff that a marketing department would never, ever do. Like, we realized that on the inside of the labels on some of our creme fraiche, it's like, it was just empty, so we thought, well, when people are finished with the product, we could use it for, you know, some sort of entertainment. Like, at this time, Jenny, she was looking for a boyfriend, so I thought, might as well try to help her out. So we used the inside. And then she got like hundreds and hundreds of like, this is like a Norwegian guy in his man cave. He's like, so you get hundreds. And here's another one. It was like, so I got this bicycle I want to get rid of, some ice skates, 10, 10 kilogram barbells. And then I have 342 issues of National Geographic from the 90s because they were just, you know, laying around home. And so people would write in and we would send them the 1994 um, Everglades issue of National Geographic. And you're thinking like, well, wh what's the ROI on that? There's no ROI. It's just like if an oat milk company sends you a National Geographic from the 90s, you're never going to forget it and you're probably going to talk about it. Um, and then we do things like bigger things, more important things. This is a recent campaign that we just did where we said like, if, how are people going to reduce the amount of carbon that they consume, the products that they consume, unless they know what each product, what's the carbon footprint of each product. And if you think about it, this is a nightmare for a marketing department. It's like absolutely, totally crazy. Like you gotta calculate it, you gotta get an independent source, you gotta redo your packaging. Oh, everything could go wrong. And so this took us about five or six months to do this and we are like, if not the first, one of the first companies to put the actual climate footprint. Um, and we can see now already one of the Sweden's largest online uh, food retailers is demanding that everyone does it. And think about it, 1994, the nutrition, 1994 in the United States was the first time that nutritional labeling had to be put on a product. Before that, 
we had no idea what was inside the product. It's the same thing. You can't make changes in your life unless you compare. So if you, if you think about this, the marketing department won't do these things because of these reasons. You can't measure them, it's too complicated, it's too, how do you approve it? It's crazy, but we're like doing that all the time. Lastly, and this is like maybe one of the most important things, is we don't play the game. We're not from the food industry. We don't know the rules. And when you don't know the rules, creatives are basically subversive, anti-authoritarian people. And it can also get quite destructive. But if you use this anti-authoritarian nature for good, it actually can be really cool. Because you can start to challenge the norms of how people do things which means that you can actually start to drive societal change. This is the biggest problem. If you want to make a change, this is how you should do it. The meat and dairy industry are responsible for like 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions. That's the same of all forms of transportation combined. And what that allows us to do is do paint walls in London like this that say 73% reduction in your carbon footprint by just swapping from milk to oat milk. Which means that, and this is the great thing as the world goes in a certain direction, is that every single carton of oat milk is basically a win for the planet. And that helps us out when we're doing things. When, when you work the way that we work, it allows you to do so many different things, like the options are actually endless. And that's why this strategy document we actually can pull off because it forces us to be, uh, um, fucking fearless. So here's the thing. You might ask, like, so how do you ever measure? Is this your, is, um, is your system a success? And the answer is right here. We launched in the U.S. Within nine months, there was a national oat milk shortage. It's quite cool, but also not very cool because you want to supply that. And we've come to realize that we'll never be, we're never going to be able to make enough oat milk. Like, the demand is more great than the supply. I mean, it doesn't matter how fast we build our factories, because we're building them as fast as we can. And that's a pretty cool way to measure success. Thank you.